introduce our, our, our first speaker, which I'm, I'm very pleased to do, uh, Dr. Amy Armstrong from Washington University in St. Louis. And Amy is actually from the Midwest. Uh, she grew up in St. Louis. She attended a medical school at Virginia Commonwealth University and returned uh, to the Midwest to complete her pediatric residency and hematology oncology fellowship at Northwestern uh, Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago. And I came to know Amy when she joined the faculty at Indiana University and had the opportunity to work together when I was a fellow. And uh, Amy's been very actively involved in clinical trials for NF1 associated plexiform neurofibromas. And uh, she is the co principal investigator on one of those trials that's ongoing currently. Uh, Dr. Armstrong recently returned to St. Louis as an assistant professor at Washington University, where she now leads the pediatric solid tumor team at WashU and serves as the site a principal investigator for the Department of Defense a Neurofibromatosis Clinical Trials Consortium. Uh, she's very actively involved in the treatment of adolescents and young adults with uh, sarcomas, uh, as well as in optimizing therapeutic approaches for NF1 associated tumors. And so Thank you so much, Amy, uh, for being with us today to share some information about NF1-associated plexiform neurofibromas, uh, which I hope will be very informative to patients uh, and their families who are tuned in today. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, thank you so much for the, the kind introduction, uh, Stephen, and I'll work on sharing my screen. Let's see. All right. Um, can you guys all see those? It's going to presenter mode. Everybody yes, see those slides? Okay. Anyway. All right. Yes. Perfect. I'm going to mind myself. Um, well, thank you for the, the intro. It makes the start pretty easy. Um, and it's nice to meet you guys all remotely. Um, hopefully, this pandemic will come to an end at some point because I feel like actual face to face talks and um, you know being able to share stories and things like that become so helpful. Um, as we deal with uh, difficult manifestations of this very prevalent disease. So the goal of my talk is to um, obviously discuss treatment approaches for NF1-related plexiform neurofibromas. Um, and I'll hit a couple of objectives um, as, we, as we go through. Let's see, let me just, there we go. All right, perfect. Um, so just some quick disclosures. Um, I've consulted for Springworks um, and M Partners, and both is in relation to NF1, which is a positive thing for the group here. Um, objectives for today's talk. So I think, um, you know, I, I'm sure we have some people out there that are dealing with these plexiform neurofibromas firsthand, um, but for the group to just really discuss exactly what is it and what is it in the context of neurofibromatosis type one and F1. Um, how common are these tumors um, and where exactly can they be located? Uh, most importantly, what problems can they cause? Um, and then, you know, as we deal with these problems, what treatment options are actually available? And where do we think the future is going for the treatment of plexiform neurofibromas? All right, so I'm, I'm glad that you kind of, as I said, Stephen, laid the groundwork a little bit for um, plexiforms, but what we, you can see here is that they're a quote unquote tumor. Um, and I put that in quotations because they're really, initially kind of a benign collection of cells that leads to a growth in the body, um, but I wouldn't classify them as being malignant per se, or type of cancer, which is the other hat that I, that I wear for um, different treatment approaches. Uh, but these tumors can grow from one or more nerves anywhere throughout the body. Um, and they're essentially composed of the cells that we find in normal peripheral nerves. Um, and can you guys see my pointer okay, Stephen? Yes, we can. Yes, we Perfect. can. Amy. All right. Um, so you can see here that this is just a normal peripheral nerve, and it's comprised of a couple of different circles inside, which are meant to represent different types of cells. Um, Stephen already talked a little bit about Schwann cells, um, which are these purple cells that you see here. Um, and the goal of the Schwann cells is to create, you know, myelin and basically support the nerves throughout the, the nervous system. But also within the nerves, you see these other cells called fibroblasts and mast cells, and then you have these neural um, bundles as well. So this is normally what things look like. Um, when we take a couple of different hits, and I'll kind of show you in some subsequent slides, you, 
you get this very dysregulated, disorganized um, growth here, which is comprised of cells that I showed you um, in panel A, but yet you can see the architecture just, you know, it doesn't look very normal all of a sudden. So the outer edge, this uh, perineum is definitely distorted. These Schwann cells are now a little bit dissociated and not really um, serving their purpose anymore. Um, you still have some normal Schwann cells that are intermixed. And then you have kind of an influx of mast cells and fibroblasts and things. I don't wanna you know, go to basic biology, but I think it's important to understand the cell types as we talk about treatment approaches as we move forward. So the question really is, you know, why do plexiform neurofibromas develop within the context of NF1? Um, so patients with NF1 are, bit, are born with um, what we call a germline mutation. So they have one hit um, to the NF1 gene. And with that, you can have some um, subsequent manifestations such as cognitive um, issues, attention, um, just overall behavior, learning deficits, vasculopathy, you know, all that we can see initially, but it's really that second hit within the gene itself that leads to other manifestations kind of throughout the body. And plexiform neurofibromas are not immune to that. So, whoops, so if you, let's see, go back here. Um, if you see here, when we get that second hit within the Schwann cells, you can have um, a development of the plexiform neurofibromas. Then Dr. Kim will kind of speak a little bit more into what can manifest from the plexiforms into the MPNSTs. But it's that second hit that some people get. So not everybody who have NF1 that can lead to developments of plexiform neurofibromas. Additionally, we know that these Schwann cells, um, which have the NF1 mutation, display what we call an aberrant RAS signaling pathway. And I'll show you guys some diagrams as we move forward through the talk. But this RAS signaling is thought to be responsible for a lot of the, what we call tumorigenic properties of Schwann cells. So what can kind of manifest them to being a little bit more uh, pro-tumor formation. And also the neurofibromas develop in the presence of what we call um, an NF1 haploinsufficient microenvironment. So I know that gets a little bit wordy, but what it's meant to say is that all these other um, cells that are part of this dysregulated um, peripheral nerve, you know, they all have one hit within NF1 already. So it's, it's kind of um, combining on with a second hit in the Schwann cell that's all of a sudden promoting um, tumorigenic formation. And I think the big thing is, you know, how common are these things, you know, as, as treatment options, you know, how big of a deal is it? How many people is it really affecting? So I think, you know, Stephen quoted one in 3000, you can see anywhere in the literature from one in 2,500 to one in 3,500 people who are diagnosed with NF1. Um, and we obviously know it's a complex uh, genetic disorder. Uh, this is from the Children's Tumor Foundation, but it's, it's interesting to know that 120 people are actually born with NF1 each and every day. And so that's a new patient every, every 12 minutes. Um, approximately 30 to 50% of these individuals are going to develop a plexiform neurofibroma. So when I try to do the math and thinking, all right, so if we have 120 people each day, you're going to have about 40 to 60 people each day who may may have to deal with a plexiform neurofibroma throughout their lifetime. So I'd say that is that is a big deal. And I think it's something that, you know, we work to address within the NF community. It's important to kind of understand the, the natural trends of a plexiform neurofibroma. And I'll show you some examples, obviously, of what these tumors can look like um, in some upcoming slides. But in general, they're thought to be benign, uh, again, benign growth. Um, but when they're in kids, we know that they grow the most rapidly. And so it happens most rapidly in children and adolescents. So this study here basically analyzed the volume of plexiform neurofibromas throughout the lifetime of patients. And you can see that as these lines quickly move up, that what that's showing you is that the volume of the plexiform neurofibroma is quickly increasing in size. And you see the, the most um, differences between initial volume and subsequent volume in the lower age groups here. You obviously see a couple in later age groups, so it's not like it can't grow later in life, but it is a lot more common here. Um, this red growth here has to do with formation of an actual malignancy from an, an MPNST. And then I think these green bars are showing patients who had a prior MPNST in their lifetime. But I think it's very, it's, you know, it's well known and we see it um, within our clinical practices as well, that the growth rate of plexiform neurofibromas and NF1 patients, you know, it's inversely correlated with age. 
Um, it's also should be noted that if you do nothing, if you just observe these tumors, you know, sometimes they may spontaneously decrease in size without intervention. I don't think that they wholly go away at all, but in general, you can see that there are some slight decreases in some of these patients where nothing really happened. So this was just an observational study throughout. Now, furthermore, you know, where, where can these be located? So initially I was saying it can develop on any nerve throughout the body, but the question is, what does that actually look like? Um, so nerves we see um, can run on the inside and outside in, in theory. So you're able to see plexiforms that develop it on the inside and outside. And there are some patients that may have a plexiform that's internally located. Um, and that means on the inside of the body that you just never knew about unless certain symptoms develop. And I'll give you guys a case example for that. Um, but in this patient here, you can see that he has a plexiform neurofibroma that it's, that's developed along the peripheral nerves of his neck. Um, this can obviously lead to some symptoms we'll speak about in a second. This is a plexiform right around the eye socket here. Um, these are what we call MRI images, and this is what we call tumor growth. So I know it's kind of hard for um, families and uh, patients who aren't necessarily used to looking at MRIs, but this is in theory a body. Um, this is the spine right here. This is supposed to be kind of the lungs. This is the normal liver, normal spleen, and this is all tumor growth here. So this would be, should be where the leg is starting, and so you see kind of within that pelvis and along the upper part of the leg a huge tumor. Um, here you see, um, this is actually supposed to be an arm, and all of this white stuff here is a plexiform neurofibroma that's developed on the inside of that arm. And obviously you could probably see with your blind eye as well. I think one other thing to note is the kind of worm-like nature of some of these tumors, which we'll go into um, when I talk about surgery, but they're pretty complex. They're not well demarcated tumors. Um, they kind of weave in and out of, of things and, and it's kind of uh, doing it as a, a bag of worms sometimes when we're describing them. And when we think about what kind of problems um, plexiform neurofibromas can pose for patients, it has to do with the location of the tumor, right? And so for this boy here, he could be at risk for problems breathing or swallowing if this is getting in the way of his airway or his, um, his kind of feeding tube. For this patient here, um, if they're not able to fully open their eye, this can definitely impair vision. Um, and I've had patients who've had to have eye nucleations and things due to the presence of plexiform neurofibromas. Um, and then when we think about here, you know, bladder and bowel dysfunction, the ability to move this leg, um, and for the arm as well, the ability to actually have full range of motion and the actual functionality of that extremity. Um, and then, you know, despite the location, some of these tumors cause immense pain. And it's interesting because not all of them will, and then some very small ones can. So I don't know a direct correlation, but pain in and of itself in my book is definitely rationale for treatment for these things. Um, additionally, there are, you know, there's the risk of a deformity, which can cause obviously emotional distress for, for, you know, the patient, for the family. Um, and I think treatment and trying to reduce, reduce the actual size of the plexiform can lead to, to great benefits. Um, and then additionally in this patient, you know, I talked about, uh, some swallowing difficulties. I have patients where it infiltrates what we call the inside of the mouth and the teeth. And so sometimes just mastication or the ability to chew can be compromised. And then when I was talking about internal locations, I don't have any imaging here, but I have a girl who came to us at the age of 13 um, for just belly pain. She ended up having some imaging and lo and behold, she had what looked to be a plexiform neurofibroma on the inside of her belly um, that was really weaving all throughout her bowels and compressing her bladder and her uterus and things. And up until that point, she actually didn't know she had an NF1 diagnosis. And so based on that, she was um, referred to our center for review. We were able to make a clinical diagnosis. Um, but I think it's just a good example that sometimes um, these plexiforms can be hidden throughout, whether they're large or small. And then really it's the symptoms that can bring them to the attention of providers. Um, for additionally, for what problems plexiform neurofibromas pose is this risk of malignant transformation. And as I said, they'll talk about, um, Dr. Kim will talk about it as the session progresses. But you have your normal plexiform neurofibroma that already has some genetic hits. It can have the risk of components malignantly transforming with additional alterations in the genetics of the tumor. Um, so usually the common pathway is it can hit an atypical neurofibroma and then turn into a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. And this requires obviously a lot more um, genetic alterations to really become a true malignancy. But I think it's important to note because about 10 to 15% of plexiform neurofibromas 
carry the risk of transforming over to a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor throughout the lifetime of a patient who has NF1. And unfortunately, that's the leading cause of death um, in patients who have NF1. So I think you know, it's a big thing that we that we are striving to address. And we're also wondering if we can address the plexiform earlier on, if we can, you know, reduce that risk of malignant transformation, which is a really hot topic amongst a lot of um, scientists within NF right now. Next, I think the most important thing is, you know, we understand what a plexiform is. Um, we understand where it can be located. Obviously, hopefully you guys will understand the, the major problems that we can see. What can, I, can, what can we actually do about it? Um, and I think, you know, up until maybe the past decade or so, really the only gold standard that we had was surgery. Um, so surgery to just remove the mass that you could. Um, but surgery, to be honest with you guys, is often not possible. Um, so these plexiforms usually have very intimate relationships with nerves and vasculature. So this is a plexiform that's in a neck. So this is what I'm trying to show you guys through the MRI. This is the patient's shoulders, top of their lungs. This is the neck. This is the brain up here. But as you can see here, if we're just going to look over to the anatomy of the neck, you see all these um, blood vessels and nerves that are running through, let alone the muscles, they're all kind of intertwined within the tumor itself. And so if you ask a surgeon to go in and take it out, it's often not possible because they can't just resect the tumor away from, from what we need to survive and to function these nerves and blood vessels. Um, and often uh, surgeons aren't able to offer a complete resection. So what they could maybe do is debulk or remove part of it from the outside, but they're not often able to go in and take the whole thing out. And what we also know is that if you do go through a debulking or surgical resection, we often see tumor regrowth afterwards. And so I think amongst us as clinicians who are advising patients on appropriate approaches, I think we have to understand that surgery may not be the end all be all cure. Um, there are two studies that really try to document this. The most recent one is up here. It evaluated 52 patients age of pediatrics to adults. I think again, we need to remember that within pediatrics, that growth rate may be a little bit quicker than in the adult population. But these patients all had surgery for um, something that was disfiguring, causing a lot of pain or functional deficits. And then they were able to monitor these patients using MRI. And what they saw was that at least 23% of the tumors regrew significantly after surgery, suggesting about a quarter of their, of their population. Um, and what they ultimately found is that the patients who really benefited from surgery were those who had a really small plexiform and that it could be completely removed. And so if we see that, um, we definitely may recommend it. And it also goes into one of the qualifications for an FDA approved uh, medical management. Um, these numbers are pretty similar to a study um, by Dr. Needle et al. Um, he was at CHOP, um, looked at a pediatric patient. So again, that growth rate a little bit quicker. And what he found within whoops, 168 plexiforms is that about half or 45% regrew after surgery. So again, a very well-known phenomenon um, that's not going to be an, an end-all cure for patients. So if surgery may not be possible, um, what else could we do, right? So I think when we talk about tumors, whether or not they're benign or malignant, chemotherapy always comes to mind. And I think what we found early on is just since these, these tumors are really slow growing without a lot of active um, genetic hits within their cells um, to make them a little bit more aggressive or malignant, chemotherapy usually doesn't work. Um, and that's kind of a, an approach that we take for a lot of our low-grade tumors as, as well, that chemotherapy may not be an appropriate um, approach for those. Radiation, so kind of the application of external beam x-rays um, used for a lot of cancers, but we often try to avoid for plexiforms. So it's twofold. One, I'm not sure that it really helps. And secondly, it can increase the risk of developing another cancer, especially in a patient who already has an initial hit um, and is at increased risk of developing cancers throughout their lifetime. So that really leads us to quote unquote targeted treatments. And I think it's targeted treatments are are a, new, a newer thing. Um, obviously, they've been around within the cancer world, and we're doing our best to apply them for benign, uh, benign growths as well, where we understand the mechanisms that go, go into the development. And so what are those mechanisms? Um, you know, up front, I showed you that the, the plexiforms are comprised of a couple of different cell types, right? And those cell types all communicate with one another and how they communicate is really important because based on those communications, if we can cut some of those off then potentially those cells will no longer be able to enhance their growth between one another. 
Jesus. And so with that, you have um, macrophages, fibroblasts, mast cells, all within that tumor microenvironment. So within the growth itself and are communicating through a variety of, of pathways or receptors. Then you have your Schwann cells as well. And then you have blood vessel formations and all these things that are kind of going into it. Um, additionally, uh, you know, Dr. Rhodes talked about it um, when he was doing his introduction, but we know that the mutation in NF1 leads to absent production of neurofibromin, which essentially is a protein that's going to regulate this, this RAS pathway. So what you're led, um, what I tell patients is this, this highway that's always, the cars are always moving and you can't just stop it. It can lead to tumor growth and things like that. So if we can introduce a stop sign in that pathway um, and stop some of that, um, the hyperactivity of the RAS pathway, you know, could that be an approach for us? And so when you look what we call downstream of RAS, you have additional RAF, MEC, ERK that leads to then the cell survival and proliferation. And you have this other um, side here where ultimately you have mTOR um, leading into cell cycle growth and proliferation. So all these components, um, a variety of scientists have tried to target to see if that can help with plexiform neurofibromas. Um, this here is just to show you that there are, have been a, a lot of trials. This is um, either ongoing, active, or just recently completed clinical trials regarding targeted therapies, I would say, within plexiform neurofibromas. Um, this is part of a paper that we just submitted, and in theory, I you know, I'm going to focus on these three agents to talk about briefly, but I just want you guys to get a sense that these are all clinical trials here that are looking at variety of drugs that target some of the components that I just spoke about. So I think it's a really rich time when we're trying to understand what scientifically may make, may make sense and then what clinically actually makes sense. You know, what are we able to translate um, to the patients? And so with that, I think the first drug that I'm going to talk about is um, something called a matnib or Gleevec. Um, we know that matnib and Gleevec can target these three components, and it was initially chosen to be studied in plexiform neurofibromas due to its modulation of CKIT. Um, and the CKIT ligand, there's thought to be communication between the mast cells and the Schwann cells within that plexiform neurofibroma. And so the question was, if we could block that, would that help um, reduce the size of plexiforms? Could that help um, prevent growth? Those kind of things. And so the question is, what actually happened? And for a lot of these drugs that, that we talk about, usually it starts in the lab and it starts um, not, not in patients, but understanding in the lab, um, how do these drugs actually work? And do we think that we could translate some of these findings to, um, to patients if, if deemed successful? And so what you see here are actually mice. And a lot of um, the studies for neurofibromatoses uh, use, use what we call preclinical models or mice models where they have the genetic alteration that can lead to tumor growth. And so what you do is you have these mice, you follow along, and then some mice receive the treatment that you're trying to study and some mice don't. And then the question is that the mice that received that treatment, does that help them or does it not? And then you compare that to the mice who didn't receive the treatment. And based on how significant those differences are, then we start to say, okay, maybe we can leave that to the patients, right? And so imatinib was tested in this, mice, in this mouse model and placebo just means mice that received absolutely no medication. And what they ultimately found uh, was the first question, would the use of imatinib reduced mast cell numbers within the tumor microenvironment, right? And you can see significantly, yes, this is the number of mast cells that, that's here on this axis here, the Y axis. And then this is mice who were treated with imatinib and mice who were treated with placebo or no drug. And you can see a significant reduction in mast cells within that tumor microenvironment. Okay, great. So then the next question is, does that help, right? And so again, in the mice, what it did show is that the mice who have this NF1 genetic predisposition for developing plexiforms, which um, are kind of indirectly seen as a growth with on the dorsal um, root ganglion, that the, the size of them were, you know, they were significantly less. So this is again, the mice who didn't receive a matinib and the mice who did, you can see a nice kind of reduction in the size there. All right, so the mice are great. So now what actually happens with the people? And during this time, um, the physicians at Indiana University where this was initially studied had a pediatric patient who had this huge plexiform neurofibroma. So again, to orient, this is her neck here. This is her face. This is where her airway should be. And these are her shoulders. And she was having breathing issues. I mean, this tumor is really taking over where, um, where she should be able to breathe and things like that. And so they quickly um, figured out a way to try a matinib. 
um, in this patient without it being part of an initial clinical trial. What they actually saw was really substantial and um, pretty immediate improvement for her. And so you see that you have an opening of airway here that the, the size of the tumor drastically reduced. Again, it was a young child. So sometimes being able to intervene a little bit earlier can be helpful for these kids. And with that, you have some preclinical activity. You have this great patient example. And then what happened was in a phase two study, um, they tried to test a matinib for a variety of patients who had NF1-related plexiform neurofibromas. And I think this is one of the earlier studies that did mark some success. We've come a long way since then. But what they found in 36 patients who were actually, they were able to evaluate that six of those patients had an objective response. And so they actually had a nice reduction uh, within their within their tumor. Um, and based on that, you know, we can realize that modulating C kit is actually helpful, maybe for um, reducing the growth, uh, the growth weight, and then the actual size of plexiform neurofibromas. All right. And I will also admit I'm not monitoring the QRAs or chat. So if there's anything immediately that I need to address, just somebody, somebody chime in and unmute. All right. So yeah. <laughs> There's one, Amy, that we could maybe take at the end, or we could do it now, uh, which was yeah. that what causes the second hit um, that I, presumably that second mutation in the NF1 gene, and can anything be done to prevent it? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I do not know what causes that second hit. Um, I'll, I'll see if anybody else is making further progress on it. But I think in a lot of a lot of our, you know, our genetic mutations throughout a variety of cancers, we don't always know what triggers it. Um, and so could anything be done to prevent, prevent it? And, you know, without knowing the exact cause, I'm not sure. And Stephen, I don't know if you have any further knowledge along that way, um, knowing kind of your more basic yeah. science expertise, if you want to add to it. Yeah, no, I, I think you're, I think you're right, Amy. And it, it's, it's been one of the major challenges we face is, is understanding what, what causes that. And I think to be quite honest, we're still not uh, totally sure why that is, but, but certainly we, we recognize that it's, it's a major, it's a very important event and, and what, you know, causes these plexiform neurofibromas to actually develop. And so I think it's a question that, you know, scientists, researchers are actively um, working on now to, to try to answer. And so it's, it's a very good question. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be neat to see where we are in, in the future. I guess I always say that because it's amazing to know where we are today versus 10 and 20 years ago. Um, and then in the next 20 years, you know, will, will that be easier? And I'll, you know, to go a little bit off target, I think other things we want to look for, at least within plexiforms is, you know, who is actually going to develop them, which is your question, that second hit within Schwann cells. Um, but are there other markers that we can find in the blood that might identify those who are going to have growth or development or things like that? And then intervention earlier on, I showed you that, you know, young children tend to grow quickly. So if you can intervene at a younger age, could that ultimately help um, lifelong and things? All right. Um, so Stephen, just chime in if there's anything else applicable as the questions kind of go on. Um, and I'll hit, yeah, uh, the other targeted therapy before we get to what everybody, you know, is probably hot about with MEC, but this other one um, that I wanted to at least address is cabozatinib. Um, and so Stephen obviously knows that within Indiana University that had studied imatinib and the relation with um, CKIT, uh, cabozatinib also can inhibit CKIT, but it has this other, um, other off targets, I would say, or multi, multi targets as a receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor um, that are all listed here. And it was chosen for study because of CKIT, but also this VEGFR2. So the thought is within a lot of these, these medications, if you can inhibit um, some of these blood vessel formations. So that's what you're kind of doing when you're, when you're working against VEGFR2 and blood flow supply and what we call neoangiogenesis. Can that help reduce tumor growth and things like that? And so that was another area that was studied um, in the preclinical model um, before moving forward with clinical trial. Um, I don't have any mice to show you on this one, but I can tell you that it was bound to be, it was deemed to be successful. Um, so it was moved over to, um, to a phase two clinical trial as well. Um, and what we know so far is that the adult arm of the cabozatinib study through the NF consortium um, that essentially was for patients 16 years of age and up 
um, did show some success. And so this is just an example, a radiologic example for a patient who had um, bladder and bowel compromise from their plexiform. So again, this kind of bag-like worms here is at baseline prior to starting the study drug. You can see some bladder and bowel intermixed in here. As they move through treatment, you can see kind of a reduction in tumor size. So this is just a cross length here within the tumor. But what I think was most notable is that the dysfunction that they had actually um, pretty remarkably improved as did their pain. Um, and in total, we had about 19 adult patients who we could adequately assess for tumor response uh, with cabozatinib. And eight of these patients um, demonstrated an actual response. Um, and just to, to kind of clarify what that entails is that there needs to be shrinkage of the plexiform by about 20% to be considered a partial response or a success in these clinical trials. And so eight of these patients actually had it here. Um, obviously the other, um, the other 11 did not. I think we also learned that cabozatinib, you know, has a variety of side effects um, and a toxicity profile that can go along with it. And there were a variety of patients that required a redu reduction in dose of cabozatinib while on study who actually were able to maintain or exceed the response from, from their actual plexiform. And so one thing we kind of teeter with is maybe, you know, treating these plexiforms, these quote unquote benign tumors, doesn't require the same dose as cabozatinib may be used for other cancers. Um, and it is used in some thyroid cancers and renal cancers and things like that. So can you get away with achieving a similar response, but maybe reducing some of the toxicities for patients too? All right, and then as I said, kind of the, the big topic for a lot of people nowadays um, is being able to, um, I would say, inhibit this hyperactive RAS pathway here. So the big thing is when we introduce a stop sign here, so um, in theory, MEK inhibitors will, will stop this pathway from continuing on, you know, is that successful for plexiforms? Um, and I'm showing you a variety of MEK inhibitors uh, through different drug companies, et cetera. And I think a lot of them have been studied in plexiforms due to the effect, which I'll, which I'll show you guys. And so just to kind of clarify, the main one I'm going to highlight, um, at least during this talk, is selumetinib, um, which will show you as being the only FDA-approved one to date. But there are a variety of others that have been studied with, with decent success. Um, so for selumetinib, what do we know about it? Um, we know that it's been studied in pediatric patients with documented data um, and that the National Institutes of Health really pushed the way in the selumetinib studies. So initially there was a phase one clinical trial, which meant that they were really trying to figure out a good dose that wouldn't be too toxic for their patients without necessarily worrying too much about the success of the drug, but they were able to also see the success in those patients. And so up here, you'll see a variety of doses that these patients were on of the selumetinib. This is a lower dose. This is a higher dose. And then within these um, 24 patients, there were 17 who had um, a confirmed partial response. So again, their initial tumors were here and then they reduced by more than 20% in size, right? Um, mm -hmm. During treatment with selumetinib. And so that was a 71% confirmed partial response, which is a, probably the best response that we had seen to date for any of the targeted um, therapies for plexiform neurofibromas. So that led to um, a phase two trial. Um, well, actually, I apologize. I'll hit that in the next slide. But to continue on with this phase one trial, I think this is a really nice uh, pictorial representation of what that means for a reduction of tumor size. And so you can clearly see the plexiform on this patient here that as she's moving through the cycle, so baseline cycle five, cycle 10, each cycle is about 28 days, that she has you know, substantial reduction in that size of her plexiform. So not only does it help um, with, you know, pain and disfigurement, but allows her to become a lot more functional movement. You can see a straightening within her back at this point. Um, so really, you know, life altering responses. Some other things that we were able to garner from this phase one study though, is if you stopped the selumetinib, that we would see um, some regrowth of tumor. And if so for some patients, if you reduce the dose of selumetinib that they were on, some would have growth as well. And so this here is showing a patient who had an increase in the plexiform neurofibroma volume. So this um, kind of at 40, after 48 months of treatment, um, after they needed a dose reduction. And this patient here um, stopped the therapy. Um, I think it was for an issue with heart function at that point, and then was able to resume. But during that time, while they were off of it, 
the plexiform regrew. And then once they went back on it at a lower dose level, they were actually able to achieve some response too. So we don't necessarily know why this patient did okay with a dose reduction and this patient didn't. But I think one of the things to understand is that there is a belief that some of these patients may need to be on the medication for quite a while to continue to derive benefit from it. And then this led to a phase two trial, um, and this was just recently published in 2020, that also looked at 50 pediatric patients, but all pediatric patients, and found that about 66% or 33 of them had that, that benchmark tumor reduction in size. But I think the more important thing in this trial is that they actually looked at a variety of other criteria to look for improvement. So even if your you know, plexiform does or does not change in size, can you benefit otherwise from it, right? And so a lot of these words here are looking at just kind of um, patient reported outcomes. How do they feel? How, what is their quality of life? Um, what is their perception? What is the parent's perception? Um, pain intensity, you know, that's pretty easy. How intense or non-intense is the pain while you're on treatment? Uh, range of motion for patients who had a plexiform of an extremity or things like that, were they able to increase their range of motion on the drug, even if they didn't maybe have that 20% reduction in size? Overall strength, breathing ability, you know, they looked at a huge variety of factors and they really found that a majority of their patients deemed some type of improvement from being on the plexiform, while a very minority of them had worsening, which is this yellow, yellow bar here, and then a few obviously had no change. But I think it's important to realize that a lot of these, these studies that we do for you know, more or less benign tumors, that growth and reduction in size is important, but also the, the impact on quality of life um, and how can we really improve um, the day-to-day -day functioning for patients. And I think importantly, um, this is adapted from AstraZeneca for Cosa Lugo, which is Selumetinib. Um, what's noted is that sometimes, you know, effects are seen immediately, but sometimes it takes a while. And so what they say here is about 42% or so um, had, had their great response, less than 20% reduction in size within four cycles or about four months. But, you know, some required eight months and then the majority really required being on this for a year and some didn't get to maximal response until like 16 cycles. Um, so what I think it tells you is that, you know, this stuff takes time sometimes. And if you don't have an immediate response or within four cycles or being on it for four months or six months, you know, you might want to give it a shot um, if the toxicities are pretty minimal for you. All right, and then leading into that, what are the toxicities? And so I think it's most important to kind of address it for selumetinib or the MEK inhibitors, just because they're more universally used right now um, than some of the other drugs that I spoke about. Um, so I think the most common adverse reaction, which are just you know toxicities for patients seen in almost half or so, some will have um, a lot of GI upset. So some vomiting, some belly pain, um, diarrhea, nausea. Um, others will have rash. It's a very common one that we see. Um, and then some other random stuff would be headaches, uh, just drier skin, feeling overall fatigue, some musculoskeletal pain, a little bit of itching, um, a little bit of kind of sores around the mouth. And then um, this uh, parenchia, you can have some nail bed findings for your, your toes or your hands. Um, or I've had some patients that I really do need to refer over to podiatry or things or for um, nail bed removal and things but things that can really just irritate the nail bed itself. Um, cardiomyopathy, it's a fancy way of just saying a little bit of dysfunction to the heart. Um, and what we've seen with MEK inhibitors, so not just selumetinib, but this class of medications, is that the amount of blood that's pumped out with each cycle um, may decrease when you're on the MEK inhibitor. A lot of patients don't feel anything, um, but when we do our screening ultrasound of the heart, we can see that that, that is reduced um, while, while only being on it for a couple of months. Um, so I definitely have had patients where I've needed to reduce, you know, hold the dose, reduce the dose, maybe put them on another med that can support their heart while they're using it. Um, eye toxicity, that's what ocular is. So you can have blurred vision, um, issues seeing, cataract development. Um, it really requires any type of vision issues to be monitored very quickly. Um, and I definitely have my patients screened pretty often by an eye doctor. The GI toxicity we um, spoke about, but the diarrhea is pretty common. The skin toxicity, a rash is extremely common, and mainly this acneiform rash, which can, can look a little bit like pimples, um, commonly see on the face, sometimes the torso extremities. Um, usually not bothersome, but for some patients, it can actually be extremely painful. and requires usage of other oral and then even topical medications. And then increase in CPK or a muscle enzyme. Um, most patients don't feel anything when it happens, um, but a lot of people will just see it in their screening blood work. 
So I think um, the most important thing to date is that selumetinib can now be used outside of a clinical trial. So most everything I spoke about um, were all clinical trials, which meant that you had to go to a center that had the study. Um, you had to be deemed eligible. So you had to meet the eligibility um, criteria for it. And then the monitoring is pretty strict when you're on a clinical trial. And if you don't necessarily live near a certain center, that might mean that you're, you're living there for the trial, or you're flying in or driving in or those kind of things. And so selumetinib um, back in April, 2020, so um, kind of in the midst of the pandemic time um, was FDA approved for the treatment of pediatric patients um, with plexiform neurofibromas. And what they, the caveat to that was that they had to be inoperable. So I told you again, that small ones that you could maybe resect, you know, that could be curative. So they wanted to make sure that we thought they were inoperable um, or that the patients really didn't want to go through an operation and that they had to be symptomatic. Um, outside of a clinical trial, I would say that selumetinib and, you know, anyone can jump in is usually managed by oncologists. Um, so both pediatric and adult oncologists who are comfortable um, in using targeted therapies. Um, Cause I went through all those side effects and we have to make sure that we're monitoring patients really closely and we know what to do. And then when we do see something that we know how to intervene on um, the medications in pill form, um, it's prescribed twice daily um, and you have to avoid food for two hours before and an hour after. So within our pediatric patients, you know, we work really hard for trying to time, time it that works for their schedule, um, go through when snacks should be, you know, maybe can you take it, go back to sleep and then wake up if you need to eat breakfast first thing. So usually in kids, we have to be pretty careful about that. Um, regular evaluations are needed. Um, so for me, I usually do a two week toxicity check. I see how the patients are doing two weeks in, but obviously they'll call me with issues before then. And then I tend to do monthly labs and clinic visits for about the first nine months to a year. Um, and then we're able to spread things out a little bit. Um, looking at the heart and the eyes about every three months, um, so a pretty formal evaluation. And then I usually wait to re-image the plexiform for about six months. Um, and I think that understanding that the radiologists at our institutions who are looking at these plexiforms are a little bit different than the radiologists um, that are part of clinical trials. Um, so we don't quite have the expertise for measuring out the tumor volume as well as some of the results from clinical trials, which can be frustrating for me, can be frustrating for patients because I can't always give them a percent decrease like I was showing you. On that 20% reduction, I'm usually not able to calculate myself um, based on the information that radiology gives me. I think the other important thing is that even with the most recent data from selumetinib, where they are saying 66% of the patients, I think 33 out of 50 showed that volumetric reduction, they actually had the images reviewed by an outside um, institution as well. And that number actually went down a little bit. I think it went down to the 40s percent of who are actually able to receive that 20% reduction. So just to understand that it does require a bit of finesse and not everybody um, may be able to achieve that for you. And then who should qualify for selumetinib? So two years of age and up, um, but it's only in pill formation right now. Um, they are working on other, other formulations. There's a minimal weight that we would ideally need for it. It's not right now approved for other neurofibromas. So if you have some small spinal neurofibromas, cutaneous neurofibromas, um, we don't have FDA approval. It's definitely worth writing a letter, um, potentially for a spinal neurofibroma if it's causing a lot of issues because it has derived some benefit. Um, what kind of symptoms? So if you have a plexiform, but it's not really causing you any issues, I'm not sure that um, a lot of us as oncologists would recommend starting selumetinib. Um, if it was in a location that could be really problematic if it grew, we might consider. And then to actually balance the symptoms that you do have. So if you have pain, if you have limitation of range of motion, um, if you have something that's really disfiguring, of course, any of us would love to help and see, see what we could get from it. Um, understanding everything is kind of a risk benefit. So sometimes we'll, we'll see some good response. It might take a year, um, but are the side effects you're experiencing while on the medication worth it? And can you actually come to an institution regularly to follow up for things? Um, I think in the advent of COVID and telehealth, it's helped a lot trying to reach out to people because I have some patients that will come hours away for treatment. And so can we do like a local telehealth and local labs and stuff like that? And then, as I said, the need for being patient while you're on it, and then also the uncertainty of duration. So I think we're all trying to figure out if it works for you, do you have to be on it lifelong? Um, can you go on breaks, that kind of thing. Um, and I think this is our last slide, as I know, it might be getting a little bit over, but future ideas for treatment. So I think a couple of things to consider. The 
we have a network throughout at least the United States, the NF Clinical Trials Consortium, where we really try to treat a variety of NF manifestations. And you can see um, things over on this side here. Within plexiforms, there have been trials that have kind of run through the NF Clinical Trials Consortium. Right now, the most recent one is the pediatric arm of cabozatinib. So I presented the adult data, but the pediatric arm is ongoing right now. So we'll be able to update that for you guys um, shortly. And then when we're thinking on future trials, it's, you know, do we stick with MEC? Do we add another agent um, with MEC? Or do we start to think about other ways that we can work with the tumor microenvironment or signaling pathway? Um, intermittent dosing of therapies. So do you really have to be on it nonstop? Or do you think you could take a weekend off or every other day schedule? Might you derive the same benefit? Um, is there a role for some of these, these therapies after surgery? So I talked a lot about regrowth after surgery, but maybe if you're on a, a medicine that could prevent regrowth, could that help after you undergo just maybe a debulking? And then can we, as talking about that a little bit earlier, but identify kids who might have um, some troublesome growth of their plexiform neurofibromas later in life? And I think, yeah, it's just about it. So this is just um, a pictorial representation of our center here. There's a lot of people that go into it. And I think um, understanding throughout the, the country, essentially the, the NF programs that have some expertise will help with all the variety of manifestations that we have. So I'm just lowly down here um, addressing the pediatric plexiform neurofibromas, um, but we have a variety of people at our institutions who will um, target different manifestations. And then also to put in a plug that I work really closely with Dr. Herbie, who's one of our adult oncologists um, for plexiforms and MPNST. So we really had that nice kind of adolescent young adult transition, um, but collaborate a lot on some difficult treatment decisions. And I think that's about it. So I can take a look at the chat and see if anything else has arisen. Um, and Dr. Armstrong, there was a question um, about adults taking Cozologum. Yeah, yeah. So it's not FDA approved yet, um, but I know that my colleague, Dr. Herbie, has definitely used it in her patient population. So um, it just requires, um, you know, talking with insurance companies and making sure that they would cover it. Um, and there are current ongoing adult trials of Cosalugo or Salumetinib, and I think that will support the FDA approval for them as well over time. And, and I think there, I think Cozalugo or AstraZeneca has some financial help and things like mm -hmm. that, but um, I know there's probably, even if they're not asking them, there's probably a lot of questions for this. Um, we have done presentations in the past and I've seen some, and I think as we go along, maybe we do something else with COSA logo to explain how people get treatment so we can answer that in the future a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. And I know that, you know, there are a variety of other MEC inhibitors and it was a short, shorter presentation, but sometimes um, use of other, other ones can be helpful as well. And sometimes we have to bounce around different classes too, to try and optimize benefit or toxicities too. So people might benefit from a follow-up hour mm -hmm. or something on that. Yeah, right. yeah. I have questions, but I'm going to hold off until we get <laughs> Get through some of the other ones. Okay. Uh, that was really wonderful, Amy. Thank you so much. Yeah. Let's see.